Oui. Oh. Hi, I can start talking. Let's wait one minute. Okay. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start, uh, you uh, share with you some procedure that you take it during this one hour. I uh, give you the floor to our panelists, and uh, you can comment during the presentations by write comments and uh, questions and Q and R. You can raise your hands. Uh, you give the floor for the audience and our special guest, Thomas Sanchez, and the end of the presentation from our panelists. So you have 15 minutes to, minutes to question and conclusions. Please make sure you mute your microphone when you are not speaking. Be mindful uh, of the background noise. You can uh, re reaction uh, during the whole presentation. Then thank you with this team, Mr. Holinsau, Mr. Gustavo Montalvo, ITU, UNESCO, UNDP, all stakeholder, partners, facilitators, and the panelists present today at the high level opening ceremony of the virtual WISIS Forum 22. Uh, it's a strange year to be connected only by virtual workshops with you, but congratulations for the amazing efforts by your team, Hoot, uh, uh, Hobson, and all the team for allowing our community to stay connected during the COVID crisis. It's a hard time for all of us, but the positive point of COVID crisis is that through virtual connections, we can spread our knowledge around the world, touching a large number of participants, including the civil society, in discussion about new technologies and ICT. It's a great pleasure to welcome on this opening and the first workshop of this year, folks and waste and water data solutions for reducing environment impact, a topic so crucial for achieving SDG 6 and our global goals for 2030 and 2050. Despite progress, billions of people still lack safe water, sanitation, and hand washing facilities. My name is Lilian Coelho Ferreira, and I shall be your moderator for the next hour. I'm co-founder of the NGO Women Dry, a platform of women and men, engineers, and the scientists in bring innovative solutions for a sustainable planet using advanced technology as artificial intelligence, IoT, blockchain, sensors, etc. Uh, project, project manager at Suez Group, and also represent the French uh, civil engineers uh, uh, leading SG9 at the Committee of Engineers in the Environment for the NGO World Federation of Engineers Organization, WFO. My focus is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, promoting gender equality, and sharing solutions to mobilize volunteers, entrepreneurs, and communities to accelerate the transition toward a more circular, united, and ecological economy. Today, I'm honored to introduce our four panelists. 
Mr. Stewart and Mrs. Stephanie Hapopart, co-founder from European Water Projects. Mrs. Elizabeth Venez, a PhD research and expert for the scientific area of Italian Minister of Education. Mrs. Sarah Melissa Leitner, a renewable energy expert from the German Development Corporation. Uh, then, I, our first speakers from today is Stephanie Hopopart, Vice, Vice President of European Water Project, a French book author from the past 20 years. She has been a United States uh, Nation representative from the NGO Market Pro uh, Mothers Matter, and is Stuart Hopopart, uh, he president also from of the European Water Project, an electrical engineer by training who work for IBM and 25 years career in finance in New York, London, and Geneva. Please, Stephanie Stewart, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Lillian. Um, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to present European Water Project today. And I want to thank WISIS and everyone at the ITU for making this possible. My name is Stephanie Rappaport. I co-founded with my husband, Stuart, the NGO European Water Project, which aims to combat single-use plastic. Before we get into the heart of the subject, I want to tell you a bit about the story that led to the creation of EWP. We live in divan les bains a small French town of 10,000 people close to the Swiss border. In October 2018, our town announced a project to build a water bottling plant. The project was to bottle our town's mineral water into 400 million plastic bottles per year and send them to Asia. We were outraged by the sheer aberration of such a project and we organized to fight it. With a group of local residents, we created a nonprofit named Stop Embouteillage Divon, which translates roughly into Stop the Bottle Plant in Divon. After an intensive fact-based campaign about the bottling project and its devastating impacts, our group became larger with members joining from all over the region. The campaign convinced so many people that Devon's mayor ended the bottling project in September 2019. This victory was uplifting for two reasons. Firstly, it showed that when people engage themselves for the environment, we can make a difference. But there was something else. At the beginning of the process, people were mostly concerned about the impact of the traffic jam on their daily lives, a kind of not in my backyard reaction. But after gaining, gaining access to factual information and thinking about it, people started focusing on the more profound issues. One, the sustainability of the project as water supplies decline due to global warming and two, the pollution induced by the production of plastic bottles, their terrible impact in polluting the oceans. Even people who have been using reusable water bottles and drinking tap water for years have become aware of how plastic pollution is destroying our planet. This graph shows that more than half the Earth has been created since 2002. It means that more than half of it has been produced in the past 18 years. Can you believe it? And plastic pollution is on pace to double by 2030. Despite the acceleration of global plastic production, we've been slow to recognize that we're in the midst of a plastic pandemic. Plastic objects are so cheap and versatile that they have become part of everyone's daily lives. People no longer bother repairing them. They simply throw them away. So today, plastic is everywhere, in packaging, cars and clothes, in the Arctic, in the mountains and the oceans. All the plastics are not the same, of course. Durable, reusable plastic can be useful and difficult to replace. But in the past 20 years, single-use plastic has skyrocketed. Plastic packaging is now routinely used in the food supply chain. Have you ever wondered how much damage buying innocuous organic basil leaves in single-use containers can do to the planet? 
All objects made of plastic pollute the environment at every stage of their life cycle. At the production level, 99% of plastic is made of fossil fuels, which contributes to greenhouse gases and climate warming. At the refining and transformation stage, plastics require additives, which release carcinogenic and toxic substances into the air. The next stage is the use of plastic-based products, which also release chemicals in the environment. How we dispose of plastic at the end of its life is also a problem. First of all, there's a very low rate of recycling worldwide. Only 9% of the 9 billion tons of plastic waste is recycled globally. And when it is not recycled, 79% is buried in landfills and 12% is burned, which again releases toxic molecules in the air, water and soil. At all those stages, exposure to these substances have been documented to cause many illnesses, including leukemia and cancer. Unfortunately, we can't escape plastic as it is in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. No wonder recent research shows that we ingest five grams of microplastics a week, the equivalent weight of a credit card. And by the way, we ingest more microparticles of plastic when we drink from bottled water than from tap water. SDG number three is good health and well-being. Isn't, that, isn't it urgent to tackle the plastic crisis to protect our health on top of the planet? One action that can easily be taken to decrease the plastic pollution is to tackle single-use plastic. Because they are avoidable and make up a huge amount of the plastic waste found globally, we are focusing on a single-use plastic water bottles, and the figures are scary. One million plastic bottles are produced globally every minute. A 20% increase is forecasted for 2021. A third of plastic waste enters nature and pollutes the earth, rivers, and oceans. A third of the plastic waste found on beaches is plastic bottles. And to make a one liter plastic bottle, you need 100 milliliters of oil and two liters of water. I'm now going to show you a short video to put this further in perspective. Well, after this video, we understand why Antonio Guterres 
Secretary General of the UN said a year ago that if present trends continue, by 2050, our oceans will have more plastic than fish. Fortunately, people are getting more and more conscious of the catastrophe. And if people engagement can stop a 400 million plastic bottle project, we sure can do a lot to eliminate single-use plastic in water bottles. And this is what led to the creation of European Water Project in 2019, with one simple goal, the elimination of single-use plastic at a global level through avoidance. At EWP, we believe that everyone should have the ability to drink water wherever they are without creating single-use plastic waste. How do we do that? I'm going to now let Stuart tell you more about our web app and how it works. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to talk more in depth about the web app and its concept. So the idea behind EWP's web app is really quite simple. Enabling individuals to locate the nearest water drinking point to refill the reusable water bottle. By using the app, people will be able to stay hydrated with high quality water. It will save money because the water is free and they will contribute to the reduction of single use plastic through avoidance. Now, how to use the app. But first of all, one important point. Don't look for a web app available in eight languages on the Apple or Google stores. It is not there. To install it on your phones, you just have to go to any web browser and type europeanwaterproject.org. On the technical side, EWP has embraced open data principles to meet its non-commercial objectives. All data for the public access water fountains uh, uh, and refill cafes powering the European to me it's not, uh, uh, is uh, sorry, uh, freely accessible by anyone under standard Creative Commons license. It has been standardized by the many contributors which have chosen to share. Uh, sorry. Uh, it has been standardized by the many contributors which have chosen to share data about water access points. It is fully reusable by any individual, any government, any nonprofit organization, or for profit organization. Once you go on the page with your telephone, you can decide to be geolocalized or just type your address, and you will see a map with blue dots for fountains and orange dots for cafes. Have you ever found yourself thirsty and felt forced to buy a water bottle? In these pictures, we see three strong screenshots of different zoom levels. On the left is a general view of Geneva, Switzerland. In the middle is a localized view of the United Nations area with five distinct blue dots representing fountains. And if you click on the top dot, a picture of a beautiful fountain in Geneva's botanical garden will pop up. All the EWP drinking fountain locations are stored on two open data databases, which are Wikimedia and OpenStreetMap. We welcome all projects which contribute water points to these databases, because together we can build a larger and more robust collective database. If you are asking yourself if you can contribute, the answer is yes. We strongly believe that keeping contributed fountain data private would be wrong for two reasons. Only publicly known water points are truly accessible and public access to clean water is crucial. It is the SDG number six. The more people refill the reusable water bottles at a publicly available access point, the less single use plastic will be generated, whether they use our app or an alternative and single use avoidance is our goal. As of now, we are very proud to say that in collaboration with the OpenStreetMap, 
and Wikimedia communities, we have succeeded in making over 240,000 drinking water fountains available worldwide. The second phase of our project to add cafes to the EWP network was supposed to happen in the spring, but was put on hold because of COVID-19. However, despite little communication, over 350 coffee shops and restaurants willing to refill people's reusable water bottles have joined the network since March. Here's an example of a cafe added by a contributor named Jake in Slovakia. In recent weeks, dozens of coffee shops have been added on the EWP app in England, Wales, France, and Slovakia. They have been added by individuals who are strongly engaged in the combat against single-use plastic. As you can see, we are called European Water Project because we are for now a bit more focused on Europe. But the app works everywhere in the world and individuals from anywhere can contribute data and pictures of public access water fountains. Here's an example of contributed water fountains in Rwanda by people we have never interacted with. They show up in our app. This demonstrates the value of openness. Our app has been available since January and has already been tested by individuals in 30 countries. We don't have data on conversion rates, but we believe it has been very low so far given the COVID pandemic. European Water Project is also very new, so it will take some time before we become well known. We would appreciate it if you would try the app and give us your feedback. Here are the three conditions that must be met for a project to be successful. We need your help to achieve them. Relevant stakeholders, governments, local communities, private establishments need to engage themselves. They must give public water access to individuals to refill the reusable water bottles. The refill points must be geolocalized and cataloged in the previously mentioned open data databases so they can appear in the EWP app. And finally, individuals must make the effort to carry and use a reusable water bottle. What are European Water Project's 2021 goals? Work with relevant stakeholders to add an additional 50,000 water points into the open data databases. Continue to enhance the EWP web app. Make our web app available to all NGOs fighting single-use plastic. Support actions promoting the installation of drinking fountains in public places. If we all engage ourselves, we can eliminate single-use plastic. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, um, Stuart and Stephanie. The first comment I would like to share is I'm so glad that you have you, a couple bring an example, the women and men together and achieve an amazing project. You demonstrate that you can uh, form a strong, uh, strong team. That uh, when you talk about uh, numbers, 70% of the fish have eaten plastic and uh, how uh, how people could collaborate with you, your project and, uh, and the resilience is so important. Uh, the homework work from today, I think I will uh, effectively install your application in my phone and everybody can help you to uh, run your collaborative tool. Our next panelist is Elisabeth Venezia. Venezia, a research and senior lecturer at the University of Bari, Aldo Moro. She teaches economy evaluation of an investment uh, in UG uh, and PG courses. She's the author of more than 80 publications. She's coordinated component of several research projects, groups, and the national and international levels. She has been a consultant with several ministers and local authorities as a senior economist in the field of transport, economics, and sustainability. She's an independent scientist expert for the scientific evaluation for the Italian Research Board for Italian Minister of Education and Scientific Research. Dear Elizabeth, the floor, the floor is yours. My thanks, Lilia. Um, good morning to everybody. So um, my speech will be just on the challenges of water, waste, and climate change in cities. 
and um, this is the agenda which we are going to talk about and um, there is a um, the first topic which is the population growth uh, for which we need to uh, think about uh, because uh, this is one of the first topic and the first elements that we need to be around then i will show you some methodologies that can be used in order to make proper forecasts in these fields and uh, we will focus also so on roles of the cities and i will show you also some experiences uh, around the world uh, so first of all we need to take into consideration uh, this population projected growth that uh, in the world will reach 8.5 billion in 2030 and it will increase further to 9.7 billion in 2015 and, and to 11.2 billion by 2100. Uh, so these are um, very uh, important elements because uh, the urban areas uh, in the world will absorb all this population growth in the next decades. So we will have a great pressure on the environment and um, the public utilities uh, utilizations. Um, also, um, just for suggesting a methodology that can be used for the assessment of sustainability of integrated uh, water resources managers, this is a, a city blueprint methodology, which is one of the best of methodology that can be used. Um, it's a sort of a, a visibility study, which starts from the baseline assessment, that we fix the objectives and targets, uh, and we use some indicators in order uh, to check in the end uh, um, the response of the project to uh, these objectives and then uh, we need uh, to have a scenario for the future and we can develop the strategies and uh, in the end there is the implementation followed by the monitoring and uh, uh, the evaluation process and uh, for example if we apply uh, to the water resource management uh, we can have some like uh, three um, type of balances uh, like an interactive quick scan of their own water cycle the access to best practices uh, in other cities and also the participation in international platform uh, as for the role of cities, uh, we need to consider that uh, they have a very important role in the economic development at, at the world side. Uh, more than 80% of the gross world products uh, uh, comes just from cities and uh, only the 600 urban areas with just 20% of the world population generated 60% of um, the um, gross world uh, product. But cities are also important not only for, not only for economic matters, but also for uh, communication, innovation, and creativity. And also for, uh, cities uh, can uh, take the uh, lead in sustainable development as they offer many economies of scales uh, with regard to raw material use, uh, energy consumption, waste, recycling, also transport and movements and infrastructures. Uh, cities uh, also create an enormous pressure on water supply, solid waste recycling and waste uh, water treatment. So th these are some of the bad effects stemming from the growth in population and because this has also um, the pollution and also on the natural and the bitter environment include the soil, air and water pollution. Uh, and this may also affect, of course, the healthy water endowments and the availability, the availability of um, uh, this healthy water and uh, as the steward was mentioned before, a drinkable water uh, at worldwide. Just to give you also some indication of megatrends in cities, uh, we need to think about uh, the, that the urban areas in the world will absorb all the population growth, as I mentioned before. And uh, overall, the world population is expected to be 67% uh, uh, of the urban in 2050. And uh, climate change, of course, may worsen water services and also the quality of life in cities. Um, uh, water withdrawals uh, triplied over uh, the last 15 years and in uh, uh, 2030 there will be a 40 percent of the supply shortage of water. Uh, as for sanitation, as um, uh, Lillian was mentioning in our introduction, currently 2.5 billion people are without improved, uh, improved sanitation facilities. And also we need to bear in mind that currently 3.4 million people, mostly children, die from water borne disease every year. And finally, water-related hazards account for 90% of all the natural hazards. 
Uh, this is a map um, that can show you uh, all the action which are uh, enforced actually um, with regard to circular to sustainability. And um, there are, uh, these are just examples of course and answers with the precise uh, comments on some of these. And as you can see, there is a very huge um, positive perception of um, these problems and also there is a big action around the world. Uh, uh, for waste, uh, a huge amount solid waste and uh, if we do not have a proper management of course uh, this can have a very bad effect on the environment um, we all know that plastic uh, plastics uh, easily enter rivers and ultimately oceans recently 275 million metric tons of plastic waste has been generated in 192 coastal uh, countries and uh, more or less 1.7 up to 4.6 percent of this plastic enters the oceans so we need uh, to um, force the cyclings uh, because uh, this can bring us to have uh, substantial resource savings um, with particular regard to solid waste uh, data we, i have to say that they are quite unreliable because um, they are not properly uh, monitored so um, we need to invest on this, uh, but uh, if we look at uh, some of uh, the data which are available, we may say that cities can improve on their solid waste management as a waste collection rate for uh, cities in low and medium uh, from 10% in peri-urban. Um, cities also uh, need to protect their citizens against water-related disasters uh, to guarantee water availability uh, and also high-quality groundwater surface and water and drinking water available for all of them. Uh, for doing this, we need to build infrastructures. Uh, there is no way of escaping these uh, aspects because even though they are very high costly, we need um, to face the demographic and economic trends with adequate infrastructure in response to uh, these changes. Uh, just to give you an idea of cost and uh, what we need uh, for the near future, uh, we may say that for the period uh, 2005 up to 2030, about uh, 41 trillion US dollars is needed to refurbish the old and build a new urban infrastructure. The cost of water infrastructure just on these uh, uh, around uh, 22.6 trillion US dollars is estimated more than uh, for energy, roads, rail, air and uh, seaports all put together. Wastewater infrastructure is responsible for the largest share of uh, these uh, 22.6 trillion US uh, dollars. Um, to support this uh, projected economic growth and also um, the growth in population, um, uh, between now and 2030, it has been estimated that the investment on global infrastructure need to increase uh, uh, by nearly 60% from the USA uh, 36 trillion dollars, despite an infrastructure over the past uh, 18 years. And uh, therefore, an investment of uh, 75 trillion US dollars over the next 18 years is necessary. Uh, more or less, just to give you an indication of the quantity of amount that we are talking about, this accounts for 3.5% of the global GDP. Uh, of course, apart from costs, we have also some benefits that uh, can stem from uh, these investments. And so we have some returns on some social benefits uh, from these investments. Um, by using some conservative evaluation, I can give you just an idea um, of what is the, the quantity of uh, benefits that we can get. Uh, between 1.8 and uh, 2.5 of the annual global GDP is needed for the implementation of water-related sustainable development goals. Uh, this will also generate a minimum uh, 3,100 3, uh, billion US dollars. In addition, economic and environmental and social benefits, which uh, uh, account for a net annual benefits of uh, 734 uh, billion US dollars. 
uh, just to go back to uh, the methodology of uh, the city blueprint that I mentioned at the beginnings, um, this can be used in order to do um, very um, affordable and uh, reliable forecast uh, because they can give us a sustainable uh, and how to say quite strong uh, feedbacks uh, because they um, uh, involve stakeholders and there is a huge collaboration between um, all people who are involved in this process. So this assessment methodology has been applied um, uh, to municipalities and region and the challenge of water, waste and climate change developed vary from one region to another. This is just uh, a case uh, that I can mention quite quickly and I'm going just to conclusion. There is the sustainability uh, in Amsterdam, which is a very good example uh, in these terms. And uh, what I may suggest is that according to the most recent um, uh, indication of the European Commission, smart cities are cities that focus on ICT, energy and transport. But uh, fortunately, we have broadened uh, this concept by including water and waste. Unfortunately, I have to say that the proposed policy is still not cohesive, for, but uh, fragmented and will lead to many um, missed opportunities. So with the urgency of the water governance crisis, it is a time that we cannot afford to lose. Just to show the final sentence for closing my speech, but I will be back with the answer in case there are some questions. What we can do today can improve all our uh, your uh, tomorrows. And this is a quote from Ralph Marston. And uh, I think that we need to be around this sentence in order to improve our uh, impact on uh, stemming from our activities from the future generation. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'm so glad you accepted this invitation because it's so important to, to understand also economists and how the provisional and the impact uh, uh, in the analysis uh, from ICT and how we did could impact cities and environment. Uh, I'm sorry, a lot of questions I have but you will talk after. But I will introduce our next panelist, Sarah Melissa Leitner. She's a renewable energy expert current work in Rwanda for the German Development Corporation. She has experience in designing data solution for policymakers and the donor programs in the off-grid energy sector and has explored digital approaches for encouraging, encouraging e-waste collection and recycling. Please, Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, some of you may ask why someone working in renewable energy is actually participating in a panel on waste and water. Um, actually, I've also been looking a little bit into the waste sector um, through my work, uh, particularly as talk a lot. microphone. Um, particularly into an area which is uh, becoming of increasing importance for our growing information society, namely e-waste. So what I would like to do today um, is to talk a little bit about um, a circular economy for e-waste, what challenges we face, particularly in uh, developing um, and emerging economies, and how data and digital, digital tools can actually help us overcome some of these issues. So uh, as most of you will be aware, with our growing information society and also with um, the increase in purchasing power around the world, uh, we're seeing a higher consumption in electrical and electronic equipment which one day will end up being e-waste. Um, according to the Global E-Waste Monitor, uh, we're actually expecting to have about 52 million tons of e-waste next year, which is about 6.8 kilograms per person. Now, in general, one may expect that this is more of an issue for um, industrialized nations, but in fact, studies have uh, shown that the consumption of electrical and electronic equipment is actually increasing more strongly in countries with very low and low purchasing power. So in the end, developing and emerging countries will be facing the same issues as all the other countries in the world on this topic, but there is one uh, difference which we need to consider when looking at this issue of e-waste and recycling. Um, when you're looking at uh, e-waste in developing and emerging countries, unfortunately the waste often does not find its way back into the circular economy would like to have. 
very often the products that are bought are either thrown out with the household waste because consumers are not aware of the dangers associated with it, or um, consumers actually give the product to informal scrap collectors and recyclers. Now, while that part, uh, the, the connection with the informal uh, recycling sector is very efficient for consumers and very convenient, it also um, bears a lot of risk because parts that are either considered worthless or that are too costly to recycle and dispose of properly are burned and dumped, resulting in uh, significant health and environmental issues. So we see everything from uh, contamination of ground and surface waters by heavy metals, to the release of tox toxic gases by burning cables, and also the emission of greenhouse gases um, from unsound recycling of fridges, just to name a few of them. Now, digital solutions and data can actually help us um, get to the circular economy and improve um, the e-waste recycling. And for this presentation, I'd like to specifically focus on this connection of how can we get e-waste from the informal collectors back into the proper recycling channels. Apart from um, the health and environmental risk that I've already mentioned, um, the other thing that we need to consider when looking at this is that the informal sector is also uh, the main source of income and employment for millions of people around the world. So if we really want to achieve um, the sustainable development goals and keep with that spirit, we cannot leave these people behind. So the question is now, how do we actually ensure that we integrate the informal sector into the circular e-waste economy? There are different approaches of doing it. Some people would say we should use legislation um, to, to address this problem, but often this has proven ineffective because the informal sector is very good at circumventing this legislation. Um, others might say that uh, we should maybe try and integrate consumers more, give them more responsibility, inform them about the issues. But at the same time, consumers are getting money, more money than they would normally get for the e-waste. And it's just a very convenient solution for them to give their e-waste to informal recyclers. So what we've been doing um, at GIZ is we've been looking at this issue as well. And we started a um, pilot project in Ghana, which is facing very similar issues. The project started in, uh, was, well, was implemented between 2018 and 2019 and was looking exactly at this issue of how we're going to get the e-waste back into the formal recycling channels. And we wanted to try the approach of using a digital incentive and payment scheme for the actual um, e-waste collectors or the scrap collectors. The project is uh, funded by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And as you see at the bottom, we were working on this project with uh, a lot of different institutions, both local and international. So the idea behind um, this project is basically to give uh, scrap collectors a different channel, um, a different place to, to deliver their, their e-waste. We were specifically looking at cables, particularly copper cables. Um, and the idea was for the um, scrap collectors to basically give or deliver the cables to our local collection partner, Green Ad, who would then um, weigh the, the cables, assess their quality, and would pay the collectors according to the quality and quantity of cables. From there, the cables would then be brought to our local recycling partner, um, City Waste Recycling, and they would then recycle the cables for us. Now, for the scrap collectors to actually participate in this, obviously the incentive was one of the key things to, to take into account and to get right. And the incentive is based on the market value of copper cables, plus an additional service fee for the collection and the delivery of the cables to um, our collection point. And this resulted basically in a price that was slightly higher than the price collectors would get normally for these cables, and hence encouraged them to actually participate. Now, in terms of the IT solutions that were used in this project, um, we're using two different um, IT solutions. One was uh, we used a software to actually document and track all the transactions. So as soon as cables would enter um, the collection point, we would uh, record the, the quality and the quantity of cables, the amount of, of money, the incentives that would be paid, how they were paid, and also to whom the money was paid. And this really, this kind of digital tracking really helped us to improve the transparency and the tracking of the material and financial flows, which is actually quite crucial because um, nowadays, 80% of the e-waste that's being collected actually goes undocumented. So we have no idea 
where it's going and even if it's disposed of in some sort of proper manner. Um, the additional advantage of this system is actually that we're basically formalizing the relationship with informal workers, which also has a benefit for them and, and for us in terms of tracking. The second sort of digital solution, uh, which is quite common in, um, in developing countries is actually mobile money. So all the payments made to the collectors were made through a mobile money platform. Apart from providing that additional transparency and additional digital paper trail, if I may call it that, um, it also allowed us to avoid the security risk associated with having a lot of cash on hand uh, to pay the, the collection incentives. And it also helps us to avoid uh, corruption, fraud, and also um, tax evasion. So the project itself um, was actually quite successful. So over 10 months, uh, we were able to collect just over 27 tons of cables. We had more than uh, 1,300 transactions. And through these transactions, we were actually able to reduce the cable burning in the greater Accra area where this project was implemented, which resulted in a significant reduction of emissions. So this is obviously only a pilot. What we're now looking at is how we can learn from this pilot, adapt the pilot, and then also implement it in other countries and also for other types of e-waste. Um, this is also one of the reasons why uh, for Rwanda, it, it could be quite interesting to look into this. Rwanda wants to become a um, ICT hub within Africa. So that obviously makes, uh, makes sense to also look at e-waste since there will be more electrical and electronic equipment being used. At the same time, uh, we're also seeing that in Rwanda, um, the government is using a lot of off-grid technologies like solar systems and mini-grids for electrification. The government has a goal of um, achieving 100% electrification by 2024, 48% of which should be reached through solar systems or mini-grids. All of those components of these systems will end up being e-waste at one point. And right now, there's within the sector globally actually no real strategy on how to ensure that all the waste from the off-grid sector goes back into the circular economy. So we've been looking at what kind of digital solutions or data solutions we can actually use to move forward with this topic. Um, obviously take back schemes like the one that was piloted in Ghana or even ones for consumers are one option. At the same time, I think there are also other areas where we can intervene. So doing things like digital campaigns for increasing consumer awareness, using applications to link customers to collection sites or collection services, and even looking at how to use existing energy access data to um, trace e-waste and also ensure the collection are some of the ideas we're playing around with um, since my program Energizing Development has actually been involved in the development of some IT tools for energy access as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of potential for using digital tools for e-waste collection and there are some tests going on, but we still have a long way to go before we can truly talk about an integrated sustainable circular economy for e-waste. And with that, um, I'll thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Estelle. And uh, we have a lot of questions that uh, uh, just uh, before Thomas, uh, give me just uh, uh, one minute that uh, you have a Batista Rochette that would like to ask something. Uh, you have the floor, Batista. Please, short question, a short answer that Thomas would like uh, uh, to, to talk to. Okay, hello. Thank you, everybody, for uh, the wonderful presentations. Uh, my question was for the European Water Project uh, that I've been uh, following the app since the beginning a little bit, and I think it's a very brilliant use of uh, open source data. So uh, I was wondering if the EWP uh, could tell us a little bit about how they finance their activities. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, European Water Project is on a very strict budget. In fact, for now, we are all are self-financing and are 100% volunteers. We're still in a proof of concept phase. Later, we hope others who share our vision will contribute. On the development side, we're also trying to keep costs down. I had a bit of programming experience, but that was over 25 years ago. So I'm learning to program again at the age of 54. In fact, I'm taking intensive online JavaScript programming classes right now, and I had to get permission from my teacher to attend today's pr presentation. 
thank you so much. much. Thank you so much. I would like uh, then to introduce uh, Thomas uh, Sanchez, our guest, that is a civil engineer who worked as public servant and Spanish Minister of Ecological Transition, chair of the working group of on water of the bubble with you. He's considered an expert in topics related to infrastructure, funding and planning and water management. Please, short uh, presentation, but uh, thank you so to be with us today. Thank you, thank you so much, Lilian. Hello to everybody. From the WCO, we support and we many and bring fruits to this WCS Forum 2020. We, the practitioners of the engineering, need the advances of uh, ITCs for better and more effective water and environmental management. The technology obtained through the work of researchers and applied by the engineers is one of the most important accelerators to achieve the challenges of the SDG 6. Let me speak to you today about the advances in the waste water treatment plants in and the reuse of water, the digitalization and the data control that technologies permits in these factories has made it possible. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a, I, I try to to share uh, a few. I think that you have uh, a few pictures. Of, Very briefly. If you, have, if you can introduce more without a screen, because I can, we cannot do it. It's not. You have only ten minutes, and uh, for the question, could you develop it your? Okay. Good. I don't think, uh, wait, wait, wait. Thomas, could you, could you continue to speak a little more? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Just, uh, you have uh, 30 seconds if you want to, uh, to say that something, but 30 seconds, please. Excuse me. <laughs> no, don't. So, uh, if you can see the, my, my paint. Well, the, today we are currently the new trend to have not only worst water treatment plants, but also biofactories. In a biofactory, the resources that we uh, do not generate waste or impact on the environment do not consume fossil energy because they produce their own energy to function. They transform the waste into resources. Uh, with water, with the Niger Kali, the energy, and also transforming waste. The apps and the digital resources uh, will be very important to connect the, to the reuse of water and the sludge and also in the energy. Uh, also, these uh, biofactories take care of, of the air. Uh, they protect the biodiversity and they introduce a new concept, a value share with the neighbors, with other industries, and with investigators. Uh, this is the, a very good sample in Santiago de Chile. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they are producing 485 cubic hectometers per year of treat taste water, and they are producing also electricity and the uh, natural gas, you can see, for a medium city. Great. And, okay. and also another practical in the Segura River, the most polluted river in Spain, with the reuse plan of water, they have reached the restoration of ecology in the river. And also, this is a very good sample. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thomas, to introduce this talk so important to you. You have a lot of people that would to share information with us, so then I would give the the floor for uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, Alireza Yari, please, you raise the hand, the hand, please. Alireza Yari, would you like to ask something? Yes, yes. Uh, hello. 
uh, first of all, I thank you all the panelists. I wanted to ask about uh, uh, using ICT in uh, waste uh, platform. There was a very good uh, idea using ICT. I wanted to know how uh, we can evaluate the cost of uh, uh, waste in the, you know, uh, ICT uh, enabled the platform, how we can evaluate the cost and how we can we can evaluate the uh, value of that waste. Okay, thank you. Maybe Elizabeth, could you just uh, give us some directions about uh, how you can finance in projects or would like to? Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Liliana, uh, and thank you for uh, the questions. Uh, there are um, methodologies that can help us for doing this. Uh, the evaluation is quite uh, clear because there are uh, guidelines which can help us to um, provide a framework uh, for calculating exactly how much we need for doing that. And also, especially the most important things uh, is to evaluate benefits that are coming from um, these investments. Uh, so maybe that uh, we can have an exchange of uh, in a chat or uh, this platform for a uh, chat uh, uh, for a cast. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, what you can do, you answer all questions that you uh, have in, uh, by mail also. Um, that's the time is going. You have another question too. I have a question for uh, Sarah. Uh, now that the pilot project in Ghana has been concluded, what are the next steps? Could you develop a short answer, please? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll keep it as short as possible. Um, so now that the pilot has been concluded, it's been handed over to the financial corporation, so the German financial corporation, who will basically scale up the pilot. Um, right now, the funding is still coming through the development corporation, but there is a plan to use a, uh, a fund that the Ghanaian government has set up to actually fund these activities. The fund basically gets money from levying um, um, kind of like taxes or, or levies on, on electronic and electrical equipment. So ideally, that's the way that the system will end up uh, being financed and then also scaled. Thank you so much. You have another person, Jeremy Circurel, raised his hand, wanted to ask him. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, good. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you, European Water Projects Tour, Stephanie, great presentation. I love the app, I'm using it already. Uh, I have a question for the re uh, reusable waste uh, water team here. Uh, Israel re re reuse roughly 90% of its waste water, and the second country in the world is only uh, Spain with 20%. How, is, how can we learn from the Israeli experience for so many countries to have the success of able to reuse wastewater, and is there any initiative uh, uh, toward that end? Short answer, Stephanie, please. Uh, that's a very difficult question, actually. Um, we really aim to fight single-use plastic, and we're related to water because we want to increase water accessibility. Uh, the treatment of wastewater is more pertaining to what Elisabeth would have said or Sarah earlier, um, but we are more uh, focused on the treatment of plastic wastes and accessibility of water, I'd say. Yes, I, I, because I'm not knowledgeable about the wastewater, <laughs> what we do with it. Okay. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I would like uh, to add some comments that uh, talking about uh, with colleagues and uh, personalities during the last year and, to, and uh, this year, uh, like Mr. Koya, United Nations representative and technical advisor uh, in the environment and agriculture for Ivory Coast. And uh, that's uh, jobs uh, in water, new water, wastewater, new waste, recycle, and recover from waste, even prison in the coming. Yes. Then 
turning a negative COVID crisis to an opportunity to invest and increase e-learning platforms, which can give the new generation in developing nations hope in innovative projects to foster development inside their own countries, avoid conflicts and wars, make a circular, a circular economy ground, and bringing women to leadership roles is an opportunity to act now. Then, uh, that, uh, last week uh, you talked, and then uh, we have the, bad, the sad news that 20 young people died crossing the ocean from the Iron Coast, uh, trying to migrate to Europe. This is younger generation who was just looking for hope, a better economic opportunity. It's our responsibility, like uh, Stuart, Stephanie, are doing, Elizabeth, uh, Sarah, that's the new generation could uh, use a new technology and uh, you can learn and then to change the world now. Then uh, I think that is very important to keep in our mind that you need to use the COVID crisis to, to change uh, the way you are, you are uh, run our work. Eh? And then I, you have a pace, uh, it's uh, one hour. I would like just, uh, if Elizabeth would like to say small words for conclusion, Sarah and Stuart too. And I'm sure that I promise for everybody that are uh, asking you and you send by email answers. Thank you. Elizabeth. Do you have it? Maybe Sarah, Sarah, do you would like to start? Well, I don't think I have, I have much to add to, to your summary. Um, I think this is a very interesting and important uh, forum that's been created and that's going to happen over the next um, over the next days. Um, I hope that all the examples that um, we've provided here in this panel were inspirational and uh, thank you for participating. Okay. Mr. Arta, do you would like to conclude? Uh, I just want to thank you very much, Lillian. Thank you to everyone at WeSIS, all everyone who attended. Uh, if people, we have a Facebook page if people want to follow our initiatives and uh, if people have ideas of how we can develop, we're all ears. We're just in the starting right now. And Elisabetta? <laughs> thank you. Liana, I would like to thank you really so much for involving uh, me and also the other uh, panelists uh, for today. And uh, it was a really um, an important occasion for us for sharing our ideas and for sure we will be available uh, in the near future for all of us who would like to share again ideas and comments on what we are doing. I think that uh, all of us can gain for, from the comparison of ideas and uh, we can grow all together. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. And Stephanie, the last words. Uh, yeah, it was wonderful to participate in this workshop, and I think there are wonderful uh, initiatives which are taken all over the place to reduce uh, global waste, uh, to treat better uh, water waste. I think it's wonderful. I hope that these initiatives can go further. Thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, speakers, audience. I hope you enjoyed it during this first section of the workshop. And uh, we will follow during this month and, and uh, until the end, uh, with this, and uh, you are here to answer all questions during this period. Thanks so much. And then uh, say goodbye. This is the next uh, workshop and to meet you together. Keep safe. Okay, you can continue. Next one.